<coughs> okay, guten tag, meine Damen und Herren. And this is the end in, <laughs> in German. As you heard, uh, Michael Kundi will uh, explain what I haven't explained in Deutsch. So uh, pick up any slides you want to have more explained in the f at the end. That's okay. <coughs> and uh, first, of course, I want to thank for the invitation to this conference and also for the contribution we have so far received from Pandora Institute uh, for these studies. And thanks to Franz, who's leaving now. And, uh, and which has been a, an essential contribution to finish these studies. And uh, I will uh, go through the last uh, findings uh, that we have. Uh, we have already heard about the huge penetration of, of mobile phones during the <coughs> recent decade. And as you can see here, it goes up to more than 100% at the end of 2000 or in mid-2000 uh, in the developed countries. And worldwide, it's coming up now in 100% almost penetration. So <coughs> almost everybody uses these devices. And of course, <coughs> this is a problem if you want to talk about precaution and safety, because this is almost like a toy for the young persons and the adolescents. They are used to it and, and to take something from them that they like and they use in that is very, very, very uh, useful for them is very difficult, even if you talk about um, a precautionary approach. This is the development, at least in the Scandinavian countries. Ericsson was one of the first ones, as well as Nokia in Finland. And they started at early 1980s with the analog phones. So these phones have been out for a pretty long time now. They were closed at 2007, the 450 megahertz, and already in 2000, the NMT 900. And we have then the GSM system, which is developing now with the fourth generation and the fifth generation is now developed uh, with a huge contribution of money from EU to that device. And the th idea is to have uh, 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 the, 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 the GSM function in all devices like uh, refrigerators, the milk package and clothes and so on in the future. So we'll see. Uh, the other thing is the desktop cordless phones or decked phones. And these have been, these have been used uh, since, sorry, <coughs> since um, uh, the end of uh, 1980s. And really few persons discuss these devices. They emit radiation as well as a GSM phone. And uh, they are very much used in offices and, and at homes, etc. instead of the landline uh, uh, wired connection. We have in all studies included the use of both cellular telephones and desktop phones. This we have seen since before, which is of course a worry is the exposure to children and not only because they are exposed to a larger extent than the grown-ups, as you can see here from the five-year-old child, but also that they have a long lifetime which is expected with continuous exposure. And if we are talking about chronic diseases with a long latency time, they will have the time to develop these, these diseases in, say, 20, 30 or 40 years or so on, which we don't know very much about so far. And I think Michael Kundi also showed this, the relative exposure to a child's head as compared to, uh, to the grown-up, which is obviously much higher here for the 2,400 megahertz the smartphones. Uh, the child is almost four times more exposed than the, than the um, uh, grown-up. And of course, this is something that uh, the consumer d doesn't know anything about, that, that the children are, are more exposed than the grown-ups. <coughs> well, we have done studies uh, during two time periods, 1997 to 2003 and 2007 to 2009. And these are case control studies. That means that we collect patients with brain tumors. In total, it's more than 3,500 that are included over these time periods. Uh, they, they have 
answer the questioner with lots of questions, including use of mobile phones and cordless phones, and also other issues like smoking, what types of occupations they have had, etc. And it's roughly good uh, um, uh, number of, of cases that have answered the questioner about 90%. Uh, of these, malignant brain tumors are. Uh, 1500 and most of them are glioma, the most malignant type. We have uh, somewhat more meningioma cases. These are benign brain tumors, uh, which uh, usually you, you don't die from them, but they can uh, anyhow give problems. Then we have the special tumor on the uh, listening hearing nerve, which is the acoustic neuroma. It's a rare tumor, about 300 cases in the study. And then we have the population-based controls, about uh, 3,500, and again, a rather high uh, response rate of almost 90% that have participated. So we have sent um, questionnaires to these individuals and asked about uh, lots of questions uh, on, on uh, mobile phone use, cordless phones, uh, etc. And these have been supplemented by phone interviews if they were unclear. Uh, information. These are the results for, from the last study on malignant brain tumors. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see, there are almost uh, 600 cases uh, up here, and we have 1400, almost 1400 controls. And um, here is uh, the latency period, that's the time from first use until the tumor diagnosis. This is the mobile phone results, these are the DECT, and these are the wireless phone use in total. And uh, usually this is not presented in other studies. They look separately, like in Cephalo, which was presented recently on mobile phones and on cordless phones. And they don't have a gr group to compare of subjects that have never used a mobile phone or a cordless phone. And we mean that's the correct way to have a group of wireless phone use, which is both mobile phone and cordless phone, or either one of these. If you look in total for mobile phone use, there is 160% increased risk, and this risk goes up and came clearly after 20 years of use. 25 years is the data we have for the longest period. It's almost three times increased risk for, for glioma. And this is the only uh, one and first study in the world that has studied mobile phone use for such a long time period. This is a significant trend, of course. As you can see, the risk comes up after 20 years' time of use. Regarding cordless phone, we have uh, actually a similar finding overall, and the risk comes up after 20, 15 years of use. There is a significantly increased risk. These are very few that have used it for more than 20 years. It's only six cases and 13 controls. And overall, for wireless phone use, we have a statistically significant increasing risk, which is highest after 25 years of use, is three times increased risk of 300%. And as you can see here, a picture of that tumor, which is located in the brain, and it's also a kind of infiltrating tumor, it grows with branches out into the brain tissue and it's extremely difficult to treat because usually when you cut out this tumor you will cut some of these branches growing out and you will leave a tumor which eventually grows back, especially the most malignant type where the survival is only less than one year, this very short time. If you look into laterality, we heard uh, by Michael about uh, the exposure, that the exposure is, if the exposure is on the same side of the brain where the tumor develops, that's what we call ipsilateral, ipsilateral exposure. That means that the patient has held the phone on the tumor side. Then we can clearly see that uh, the risk for mobile phone use is highest overall on that side and also for cordless phones. Whereas on, for those cases that have used the mobile phone on the other side, then the tumor develops, the risk is lower, and it's actually not statistically, statistically significant. This means that there is some kind of internal control in the study that uh, 
the results are valid because we find the results according to what we should have expected biologically. The, the, the risk comes out on the same side of the brain where the phone has been used. <coughs> now, if you look into age, and in this study uh, during 1997 to 2009, and mobile phone use <coughs> overall, and uh, you look into different age groups, those who started the use before 20 years of old, uh, age, in the age group of 20 to 49 years, or those who were 50 to 75 years old, what is the risk? And as you can clearly sh sh see here for mobile phone use, that the risk is highest in the youngest persons. Those who were below 20 years of age, they have 180% increased risk. It's lower risk in the old, older age groups, but still a significantly increased risk. And especially if you look into ipsilateral use, I mean they have used the mobile phone on the same side as they develop the tumor, then there is obviously a very high risk in those subjects who have started before the 20 years of age. That means also when one looks into statistics that it's necessary to look into different age groups and how is the incidence, the number of new cases developing for different age groups. And we would expect that the younger persons will have a higher number in the future. Uh, well, this is the similar results for cordless phones. Uh, I mean the decked phone and the age groups, 20, 20 to 49 and over, over 50. And we find exactly the same pattern here, that the highest risk is uh, among the youngest ones. Uh, and they are substantially, rather many here, 46 cases and 48 controls. And of course, especially for the ipsilateral use of a cordless phone, it's uh, three times higher risk to, to develop a glioma. And this is overall findings. We haven't looked into uh, sorry, into latency period and uh, cumulative number of hours, etc. And that's, of course, not so easy to do because the numbers are still rather low, but, but uh, the results are pretty clear there. We have also looked into the hazard ratio for survival, and these are actually unpublished data, uh, where we look into the risk to die quicker if you have used the mobile phone or the cordless phone. And that means that um, for glioma cases here, and they have a latency of 20 years, I mean the, the group where we find the highest risk for, for glioma, and uh, if they have used the wireless phone, they have 170% uh, greater risk to, to die quicker if, than if they haven't used. And the mo mobile phone and cordless phones give similar results. And this is finding, especially for the most malignant type, the glioblastoma or astrocytoma grade 4, you can see that the risk is two to three times higher to die quicker if you have used the mobile phone or the cordless phone. This means that uh, we have a biological mechanism here that indicates that the radio frequencies, they do, do not only increase the risk to get the tumor, but they have also an effect on the growth rate of the tumor. It means that uh, the, there would be a more aggressive tumor and it will grow quicker and the patient will eventually die quicker if they have used the, the mobile phone. This is similar as for findings lately, like smoking and the risk for uh, tumors in the mouth, etc., where we know that smoking can have a bad effect on, on that. And we looked into different age groups again, age at first use and, uh, uh, and the survival. And again, although based on low numbers, we can see that those who had the first use before 20 years of uh, age, uh, and we look into wireless group or the other ones, they have a worse prognosis than in later ages. Uh, so actually it means that uh, the young persons, they don't, they have both an increased risk for glioma, but the outcome of the disease will also be worse. And uh, this is a figure of how it looks like in our data. And this is the risk, no risk, 100%. And then we can see the solid line, which is the increasing risk over 
number of hours that you use the mobile phone. Uh, no, sorry, wireless phone. It's both mobile phones and cordless phones. And you can see that uh, these are the confidence limits, I mean the statistical significance, and the risk comes out uh, up after some 3,000 hours cum cumulative use, and then the risk is statistically significant. And it's a linear uh, relationship here almost, so the more you use uh, the wireless phone, the higher the risk. It means also that there is a biological sense of this uh, the results, uh, this uh, classic dose-response type of curve. Uh, and uh, uh, what about uh, latency? Uh, the figure is somewhat different here. We have the use of wireless phone over the years, up to 28 years, which is the longest time period we have in the study. And uh, this is the risk over years. If you have used it for, say, 10 years, uh, then we don't actually find a significant risk. The risk comes after almost 20 years of use. So this is the lag time which is rather long and we haven't faced that time as yet as to the broad mobile phone use in the society and the risk. Uh, there is another remark here and it is that uh, it seems to be by basic. There seems to be something which is um, uh, like uh, late carcinogenesis. We don't know if this is uh, for, for certain but there is some indication that if the tumor comes here, these are the years before the tumor developed, there can be an effect some years before the tumor, which means that there can be a progression of the tumor, a growth uh, acceleration. And then the other one could be an early carcinogenesis, that's an initiator, a classic initiator, which means that uh, something happens here which starts the tumor to grow, and then it takes the numbers of years until diagnosis. This is a classical concept as to carcinogenesis. We have also made a meta-analysis of our studies and interphone, which is um, practically the results that are now for in this area. Uh, we used the um, uh, exposure criteria or the uh, criteria in, in interphone, cumulative use more than 1640 hours and uh, uh, reanalyzed our studies according to these uh, interphone criteria. And obviously this meta-analysis gives for glioma uh, 2.5 increased risk for uh, tumor on the same side, uh, but also a somewhat increased risk on the other side. And in the temporal lobe, which is the part of the brain with highest exposure, there is a doubled increased risk. Uh, regarding the contralateral, there is obviously no uh, exposure in that group. I mean, some, some uh, uh, radiation goes th through the brain, and we have also defined contralateral as those who use it uh, for less than 50% of the time, so they have some exposure. Here is again some kind of intrinsic dose response that we find on a biological mechanism uh, according to where the exposure is. We have studied uh, meningioma, as I said, and these are benign uh, tumors, which are usually on the outside of the brain. So they're actually in an area with high exposure, if you look into those uh, slides Michael Kundi showed. Uh, this is uh, based on 700 cases and 1,300 controls. We do not find any increased risk here. And this is uh, contrary to the glioma findings. It's the same study, and if there is some mistake in the studies, then we should have found the same result, regardless of tumor type. But here is uh, no increased risk. If you look into latency wireless phone uh, used, you remember the other figure for glioma, which goes up like that. Here is, it follows the 1.0 uh, risk all the time. So that means that there is no increased risk up to 28 years in the same study. So we have actually tumor specific findings. And if we uh, pool our studies with the uh, interphone, the meta-analysis is pretty close to one. It doesn't give any increased risk in both studies. And this is also a mark of, of that the findings should be real, actually. <coughs> uh, we have uh, also results for the acoustic nevrinoma, which is, as I said, a rare tumor and uh, in total we have here 
338 cases and we have used uh, the whole control material. This is a tumor which develops in, on the eighth cranial nerve, that's the listening nerve. And as you can see, this is an exposure area. If you have the mobile phone here, the radiation penetrates to the nerve area. And um, uh, we have, uh, let's see, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, here are the results from our study. And uh, again, we can see that the, the results, both for mobile phones and cordless phones, comes after, after pretty long latency period. Here is 20 year uh, data, which is about four to six times increased risk. And for wireless phones, it's significant in that group, 400% uh, increased risk. So it's again a, a time dependent uh, result. Uh, and um, interphone uh, um, results together with our gives a significantly increased risk for ipsilateral use. That's the same side as as the mobile phone has been used and no increased risk for contralateral use. So again, there is from a meta-analysis, it shows uh, risk for glioma and acoustic nevinoma, but not for, for meningioma. And this is the latency figure from our studies, which shows that uh, there's a solid line which increases with number of years, up to 28 years. and. Uh, here is no increased risk, the red line, and after some six years of latency, six years before the tumor diagnosis, the risk is statistically significant, but of course increases with time. And the, the range here is very wide because uh, these are few, based on rather few numbers, but uh, the results are anyhow there showing an increased risk. So in summary, we find uh, an increased risk for glioma and acoustic nevinoma, but not for meningioma. And highest risk for ipsilateral tumors, that's uh, located in the, in the uh, same side as the wireless phone has been used, and also in temporal, sorry, misspelled, temporal lobe, which is the lobe with the highest exposure in the brain. And the highest risk in the young age group, and we have also a decreased survival in persons that have used the mobile phone, which is uh, something that has not at all been discussed actually, because it's another aspect as to prevention that it increases the risk, but it also gives a decreased survival. Uh, Michael Kundi has said something about this IARC evaluation in 2011. I was one of those uh, 30 experts there. And IARC has uh, four groups. Group one is established cancer, two A probable, two B, B possible and not classifiable. Uh, and group four probably not carcinogen. And this, uh, during this, it ends with a voting at the, the final end. And there was actually only one person who said that it should be uh, group three, a person from German, by the way. Uh, and there were, uh, um, one person who didn't vote, there were two persons absent and all others voted for group 2B, which was somewhat surprising because as I understood there, many people uh, thought that it should be this not classifiable group uh, at, um, at the final. So there's very much to say about this meeting, but, uh, but uh, uh, we I'm sorry if I have to skip that now. It came out with the IARC monography. It's, uh, it has been on the web uh, for some time and was published uh, for some months ago. And this deals only with cancer effects, so there are not other endpoints that were discussed there. Uh, there have been some responses, uh, like uh, uh, WHO fact sheet, which, which very soon after came out with this uh, statement uh, to date. No adverse health effects have been established as being caused by mobile phone use. It's a very surprising um, fact sheet from WHO, which came one or two months after the IARC 2B classification. And IARC is a part of, of WHO. Nobody knows who wrote this, actually, uh, for, for WHO. And um, some persons like uh, Anders Albom in Sweden said that uh, 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 that the risk is non-existent 
Maria Blechner, by the way, was the only one who said it should be group three. And this album should have been uh, the, the share in the epidemiology group, but uh, he was uh, a few days before uh, revealed to be working uh, as a lobbyist for the telecom industry. So he was, the, he was forced to leave the, the IARC. He was not invited anymore. Uh, Lerchel tried to get invited. He sent um, several begging letters to IARC and asked for him to be included, but he was excluded because, he was, because of his conflicts of interest that are obvious. We used uh, the high hill criteria from 1965 uh, recently to go through this area and see what uh, the risk is. These were used uh, for the evaluation of smoking and the lung cancer. And uh, Sir Bradford Hill, he developed nine criteria that should be fulfilled to some extent, at least to, to, to talk about causation instead of association. Epidemiologists like to talk about associations and not causa causation, that something causes a cancer. And we uh, published this um, recently, and if we look into these Hill criteria, actually most of them are fulfilled, which means that uh, it should be, ac according to Hill, be uh, uh, group one, that the radio frequencies are carcinogenic to humans. Uh, of course, uh, not many people would like to say that, but one can say that at least 2A, that is a probable carcinogen, would be the next step in this process. But using the Hill criteria, it could even be <coughs> group one, because there has been coming more evidence after the IARC meeting. Uh, regarding what's happening in the society, there has been, as you may know, about the Italian litigation where a person get uh, nevrinoma, the same type of tumor as an acoustic nevrinoma, uh, in the fifth cranial nerve in this area, and he was, uh, uh, he, he had used the mobile phone and the cordless phone for a long time in, in his work, and, and he got compensation for that. It uh, has been, the trial has been for some years, but ended in Supreme Court, uh, court in, in uh, uh, Rome uh, one year ago, and, and it was decided that this, this was a tumor that should be compensated. There's also a case from uh, um, Israel, where a man gets a lymphoma, a lymphatic disease, close to his ear. And this was um, um, a settlement with a, with a mobile phone industry, so they paid him this amount of money for, uh, for as compensation. But these are <coughs> the only ones that have been compensated so far. But according to my view, it's time to, uh, to, to pay those pers persons' compensation that get these types of diseases. Uh, there is another one which is thyroid cancer. I don't know what's that in German. Uh, it's a uh, uh, tumor on the... Yeah, it's located here. And it's obviously an area which got uh, relatively much exposure uh, from the smartphones. And there is an interesting study from uh, Israel, where they show that there is a growth, increasing growth rate of the thyroid cells when they are exposed to electromagnetic radiation. Mm -hmm. And if we go to statistics, something has happened worldwide. This is from Sweden. Something happened here around 2004 or something. The incidence is going up both for men and for women. These are the latest data from 2012, so they are quite recent. Something is going on, and one risk factor which is known for thyroid cancer is ionizing radiation. So uh, it could either be that we expose the children to dental radiation once a year, almost, in Sweden. And this is, I think, done worldwide, which, is, which is, could be one risk factor. The other one is, of course, the radio frequency fields. But there are no other risk factors that have been changed so much in the society which could explain this. And this is uh, obviously something that should be studied if somebody, somebody has the time and resources. Uh, what about brain tumors? Denmark has a rather good um, database, and this goes from the end of 1940s for brain tumors until 2011. And as you can, can see, there is something that happens here in early 2000, where a steep increase in both women and men of the incidence. 2012 gives a inc further increase in the incidence, which is not on this uh, uh, slide. 
Uh, well, uh, we have to some extent discussed uh, how this is handled by different agencies. This is uh, uh, the Danish Sundhetsstyrelsen, uh, this is uh, Finland, uh, this is uh, the Swedish, Swedish Radiation Safety Authority, this is the Norway and this is East, um, uh, uh, Iceland. And they came out r rather re recently with this statement. Uh, the overall data on brain tumor and mobile phone use do not show an effect on tumor risk. And this is of course a problem if you have a statement like that with, which uh, is not qualified what they, what they think is the basis for that and it gives also the signal to, to the society and especially of course to the young persons that there's no risk. You can use this as much as you, as you want. And th this is, uh, is a very surprising statement and, and one wonders uh, if, uh, if these committees are, are, are gathered according to their opinion or according to their competence. Uh, there was a commentary in uh, epidemiology, a well-known epidemiological study, which is, came out rather recently in January this year, and it was written by Jonathan Sammet. He was the head of the whole IARC evaluation in uh, May 2011, and the other ones are IARC staff persons. And uh, they said that um, analysis of data from the cancer registries uh, of the Nordic countries supports a similar null conclusion. Uh, and overall, overall these uh, data uh, do not remove the uncertainty inherent in the possibility carcinogenic classification. So it was some kind of, of downgrading of the risk in this uh, paper. And um, also the similar is coming out from uh, Skenir, which is uh, uh, the uh, European Commission's uh, committee, which has been working until 12 December 2013, giving out a preliminary opinion. And they don't really see any uh, substantial increased risks. The problem with these uh, both evaluations, as I see it, is that no one has included our latest studies. So all these from five publications from uh, uh, 2000. Uh, uh, 13 are excluded, and one wonders why. I mean, if, if they should be uh, honest, they should at least include them and say why they don't believe in these findings and not be selective in, in the inclusion. Uh, the Skenir says here about uh, the uh, Schwarz study, uh, they discuss it and and say uh, that uh, there are indications of data fabrication, inappropriate statistical analysis, uh, etc. And they make a reference to Lerchel. And, and this is a very serious claim that uh, these data are fabricated in a, saying that in an EU document without further writing anything about the, the rebuttals that have been made uh, regarding this uh, accusation. And uh, we have, of course, uh, sent our comment to EU about uh, the exclusion of our studies. And I, I think that this should uh, vigorously be, be defended by, by this group, that this statement cannot be there. Because uh, one must understand the, the uh, importance of these committees' reports because they be, will be used at the, as the golden standard worldwide. And if you as a single person, they say, okay, yes, it's the single person, it's uh, Dr. Kondi or Hadell, or they are saying C and so. But look here, we have a, a group of, of um, representative persons, worldwide well known persons who have written this, and of course, you must believe them. And <coughs> uh, so, um, we had one of our group, Chalanson Mild, was part in that committee. He was on the technical aspects, but he, he sent and gave them all our studies when they were, were produced. And uh, Joachim Schütz, who was responsible for the writing the epidemiology, he refused to include them and said that uh, he won't take them in without no further discussion why. And uh, so I'm just wondering what's going on in the worldwide uh, evaluation. 
the summary of Skenir is based on the most recent cohort studies, and this is his own, Schutz's own study, the Danish in incidence study, the in in Danish cohort study on mobile phone users, which is much <coughs> criticized and the incidence time trend, and they don't take those countries which show an increasing... In they, 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 it appears that the evidence for an increased risk of glioma became weaker while the possibility of an association with acoustic neuroma remains open. And this is a statement they can make because they are selective. They include the studies they want, and the studies, not all the, all the studies that show an increased risk, like ours, for example. So I'm just wondering what's going on. Is this the type of, of persons we have in these committees or, or not? It's an open question. Uh, I will end just with these, which I see as, as a growing problem, and it is the use of wireless networks in schools. And, and uh, it, this is propagated very vigorously in Sweden. Uh, and uh, it's extremely difficult for parents to resist this so-called uh, development. And um, there is uh, different types of exposures here, which we should not go into this time, but uh, like laptop, uh, laptop exposure and uh, iPad, etc. Uh, so how is the radio frequent uh, pollution? These are pretty new data from Sweden. And as you can see, the maximum exposure in Stockholm, in Old Town, is rather high. It's 510,000 uh, microwatt per square meter. Uh, in Sundbyberg, outside Stockholm, is also high. And of course, the mean values are lower. And when you go to smaller parts, like Eversberg, that, that's a part you pass when you, if you ski the Vasaloppet in Sweden, it's very comparably low. The problem discussing these um, uh, emissions is that uh, uh, different agencies, they want to talk about average. Should, should we talk about average exposure or should we talk about these peaks, which can be very high? The same with mobile phones. The peaks can be high, but the average uh, can be much or is much lower. And as far as we don't really know the mechanism, we need to consider these peaks of high exposure to. Uh, and we should need to do much more on, on the exposure situation in the society. So I think this issue about uh, 2B should be continued, uh, the IARC classification. And uh, unfortunately, IARC make, makes these evaluations with long time in between. So it will take 5, 10, maybe 15 years until a new evaluation. So we have to live with 2B for many years. Okay, this is the ending, and if you have questions, I'm sure that Michael will clarify it. <laughs> Thank you. genauso gemacht hat. Dr. Mutters Arbeiten hat man ausgeschlossen von der Bewertung. Entschuldigung, dass ich es nicht in Englisch gesagt habe. Ja? Also man hat seine Arbeiten aus... Das ist... Kann ich ja nicht. Ja, es ist also gesagt worden, dass das im Fall der Amalgamforschungen von Mutter ganz genauso war. Wir haben auch eine ganze Reihe von Wissenschaftlern, die aufgrund ihrer kritischen Arbeiten ihre Stellen verloren haben oder entmachtet worden sind. Das ist ein Problem für sich. Wir sind auch bei Darius Leschinski mit diesem Problem befasst. Ich würde jetzt aber sagen, ich glaube, es war wichtig und die Sache wert, dass wir hier die Zeit voll ausgeschöpft haben, die... Bitte? Ja, bitte aber ganz laut zu ja, besprechen. Ein ganz kleiner Beitrag. Mein Tochter wäre ein Link geschickt von Yahoo, wo gewarnt wird, dass Kinder Smartphones benutzen sollen. Yahoo sagt das. Das sei nicht so gut. Sie sollten dann lieber zu Handys greifen. Gut, das ist die andere Sache. Aber Sie waschen sich da sozusagen eine Liste rein. Das ist zumindest schon mal interessant. Ja. Gut. 
Äh, gibt es sonst ganz, ganz hinten, bitte ganz laut. Yes, uh, they are used very much, both uh, laptops and uh, iPads, and they are going down into the age groups. So, I mean, there are different problems in, in schools. It's uh, these wireless communications, and there can be one system for the students and another one for the teachers, but also that you have, of course, the uh, base station exposure from outside, and also that much devices in schools in Sweden now are... are uh, uh, handled by wireless communication, like uh, locking the doors and uh, uh, looking to the ventilation system, etc. So there can be many sources nowadays. And, and what I would like to see is really measurements. I mean, we can talk about this, but we need to have the data and the measurements, how much, how high is the exposure, and, and put that in relation to what we know about uh, biological endpoints. For example, bioinitiative report shows uh, biological effects in 30 microwatt per square meter, which is extremely low. But we don't know, of course, if that is, that's a health problem or not. But there are effects at very, very low uh, emission levels. Yeah? One question to Do you know uh, of if there are studies like yours in German Olympics? In our region, we uh, see here an immense increase of glioblastoma and a tumors in a difference in the region from 30 kilometers of geometry. And I would like to know if there are studies in, from the new Es gab einen deutschen Zweig der Interfon-Studie, aber über diese zwischen 2000 und 2004 durchgeführte Untersuchung hinaus gibt es in Deutschland keine Studie. Gut, dann doch mal die letzten zwei Fragen dort hinten. Um, I read that there is a, a tendency to remove that status again. What's the status for on that? Well, uh, class group 2B was, uh, I think, a shock for industry. So uh, there is a huge effort from industry and its allied experts to, rule, to move it from 2B to group 3. And, and uh, well, I don't say that it is in that way, but if, you, if I read these papers as I took up uh, the summit paper and the skinny report from EU and also the Nordic uh, governmental agencies who say there is no increased risk, that's in the same line to, to, to move it from group 2B to, to group 3. And one must also understand that this has a huge impact on any litigation in USA. If people are going there and asking for compensation, then we talk about money. I'm somebody who is very um, receptive of this radiation, and to my knowledge, I've, I've uh, had some measurement devices and I measure as a Myself, I'm uh, starting to react as of five microwatts in total. My sister has a brain cancer on the side, on the side where she used the phone. And uh, the, the owner of the house where I lived in the 90s had a cancer here. And this was related to the intake from the center just 500 uh, meters away, and it was about 200 microwatts in total. So there is a lot of things ongoing, and uh, as you said, uh, the cancer rate is increasing. And what I can only say from my, um, my experience, just buy a device and uh, take your measurements, and uh, then you can see it. And it's, it's, 
a lot of, let's say, a lot of uh, overlapping between the different systems. Yes, just a short comment. Uh, this is very interesting comment about the electrosensitivity because, uh, I mean, I have got so many personal reports that there is an individual sensitivity to these types of radiation. I mean, most of us, we do not react at all, but then there is a group of persons who react like there are persons that are sensitive to other agents in the, in the society, and there is quite a lot of endpoints for this sensitivity, like skin reaction, headache, etc., which means that the medical society has said that, okay, it cannot be a problem because you don't have just like a heart attack, you can say that this depends, or these symptoms are coming, because there's a, so multiple symptoms on the same head, so to say. But there are definitely persons who are sensitive, and we shouldn't ignore them, and we shouldn't force them to live outside the society, we should ins change, instead change the society so that everybody can live it, in it. Noch, Moment, noch eine dringende Frage jetzt von Klaus Scheibsteger, der besondere Verdienst um den Film der Handy Krieg hat. Äh, ich habe nur eine, I'm saying laut, laut, Klaus. I'm, I'm trying to say in English. The, the industry is um, celebrating at uh, the 2B classification as a victory. They say um, it's the same classification that has been applied to hundreds of other agents, such as coffee or pickled vegetables. <laughs> That's the problem. Yes, but uh, this is an old misquote uh, that was also... Oh, Julia. <laughs> 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 uh, das wurde schon gegen die Klassifikation bei den niederfrequenten Magnetfeldern vorgebracht und wurde ganz genauso jetzt auch auf dem Mobilfunk angewendet und äh, ist alles falsch. Ähm, Kaffee ist ein bekanntes Kanz Kanzerogen für Blasenkrebs, aber auf der anderen Seite ist Kaffee protektiv für Darmkrebs. Und die WHO hat, die IAC hat es auch ganz klar gesagt, dass äh, äh, gegenüber dem Benefit des Kaffees, was den Darmkrebs anlangt, dass das Blasenkrebsrisiko weniger Bedeutung besitzt. Äh, das zum Kaffee, was die Mixed Pickles anlangt, das ist auch eine Frechheit, denn es handelt sich nicht um die Mixed Pickles, die Sie beim nächsten Supermarkt kaufen, sondern das sind speziell fermentierte ostasiatische Gemüse, die kein Mensch bei uns essen würde, die also vollkommen ekelhaft riechen. Das sind also ganz spezielle asiatische fermentierte Gemüse, die tatsächlich aufgrund des hohen Nitrosamingehaltes kanzerogen sind. Also darüber gibt es überhaupt keine Diskussion. Dann dürfen wir nochmal Lennart Habe ganz, ganz herzlich danken.